Greetings. I think this video is going to exceed the time limit, so if you're one of these people with a short attention span, well, I guess you'll be missing the rest. It'll probably be in two parts, but it's a complex topic and an important topic. I want to talk about the uh, state of affairs with regards to advanced reproductive technology. Uh, so let, let me just start by talking about where we actually are in terms of progress. Now, my point of reference, there could be several, but I, I want to keep this kind of simple. This will, is, is off the cuff. Uh, it's, uh, I'll post a link to the article. It's a, it's a radical feminist article, pretty much radical, heavily, femi heavily feminized article, if you will. Uh, but it's, interesting, it's an interesting read because it talks about two different perspectives coming from feminists with regards to reproductive uh, technology or advanced reproductive technology. Now, as far as actual stuff that's gotten done, things uh, that are progress that's been made, they're really, I mean, as they cite in the article, they're really two major um, steps forward. Or the, the two major sources cited as, as progress are one uh, gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Yoshinori Kuwabara, uh, and my Japanese is nigh non existent, so apologies of uh, Shutendo University. And he successfully uh, uh, gestated some goat embryos in a machine uh, that uh, holds am uh, amniotic fluid. And the other one, closer to home for some of you, is a female Suma. It's a very Chinese name, so I'm assuming she's Chinese, uh, Dr. Helen Hongqing Liu. Um, director of the Reproductive Endocrine Laboratory at the Center for Reproductive Medicine and Infertility at Cornell University. Most of you know Cornell, it's pretty famous. And that was back in 2003. And she managed to uh, grow a uh, mouse embryo, almost a full term, um, by adding uh, bioengineered tissue and uh, extra uterine scaffold and some other uh, supplements. Um, and, and even more recently, apparently, she uh, managed to grow a human embryo uh, for about 10 days in an artificial womb. But sh her work is limited by legislation, go figure. So uh, that's, uh, that's another uh, blockade, if you will, or another uh, damper in it. And, but she's working on this. Uh, she's fully devoted to the idea of uh, ectogenesis, or you know, birth outside the womb, the external womb. Now, these are the two primary examples. So, it's not a question of how, uh, sorry, a question of, 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 of if, but it's certainly a question of when. It's going to come. But what's interesting about the feminist take on this, uh, on reproductive technology, is that there are essentially two camps. Now, one camp, uh, you have already heard, now, uh, from, say, Barbara Russell, he cited... Uh, some passages from uh, Dworkin, and she talks about the possibility of such things, uh, artificial womb particularly, as being very dangerous to women because it takes uh, it takes their primary asset to human human beings, their primary uh, uh, trading chip, if you will, that is re vessels of reproduction, away from them. And I'll be talking about that a lot more extensively. Now there are other perspectives on on uh, reproductive uh, technology uh, or advanced reproductive technology such as artificial wombs. Now the the late uh, radical feminist Shumalith Firestone, who was uh, one of a kind, she wasn't dumb though. Uh, in this book, uh, her book called The Dialectic of Sex, basically implied that uh, the artificial womb would simply get rid of uh, the biological, the, the tyranny of biology uh, imposed on women, and I suppose it would. Of course, she put it under this, you know, the usual radical feminist uh, patriarchal structures, blah, 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 biology being employed against them. Um, so they're really kind of two camps, and I think these, from what I've read uh, and gathered, that these two camps have remained pretty firm and solid in their division as to who wants artificial womb technology and, and, and who doesn't. But I think ultimately, as we've seen in the recent video uh, by Barbarossa on surrogacy, that 
the camp that is that recognizes women's primary and, and virtually only asset, their reproductive capacity, um, is probably the camp that's going to win. Because for all their bloviating and uh, guffawing and you know, the women are, they are so great, this and that, feminists in general, they, they always go back to the their the trading chip, you know, reproduct abortion, uh, abortion rights, uh, out banning surrogacy, and when it comes to reproduction, they have a an iron uh, tight grip on that. So I think the camp that represents the Dworkian school of thought, if you will, with regards to artificial reproductive technology, will ultimately uh, win out. Because remember, women are afraid. They're they're perpetually afraid. It's probably a genetic thing. They're afraid of everything, even though they're the, the, even less so than children. The group in society at least elected, at least affected by violence, even less so than children. They're more afraid than everyone. They're more afraid of violence than children or men, and men being the ones most affected or the least afraid. So, you know, there's a consequence and a, a legacy of our evolution. But but that fear the fear of loss of control, uh, reproductive control, will ultimately, I think, uh, drive the debate within the so-called feminist community to the Dworkian school of thought. Because let's face it, let's be honest, uh, women for decades now have been given ample opportunity to prove themselves the quote-unquote equals of men, to make the same kinds of advances, uh, to engage in hard labor, they can work on, if they wanted to, if they're capable, they could work on oil platforms in the North Atlantic. They could work in the mines of Western Australia, earning good money at the risk of their health. They could do that, and they're not doing it. They could also become top-notch engineers, uh, and a few of them have, but not many. Certainly not by the numbers uh, that feminists might, might wish they had. And you know, why there always needs to be more work uh, done in the name of feminism for the sake of women. So... Let's face it, at the end of the day, men, men have built civilization uh, with their physical strength and their mental prowess. We, we wouldn't be having this conversation now if it weren't for the ingenuity and the endeavors of men. And women have, in large measure, been uh, passive uh, standard, standard, uh, standard buyers, if it were, as it were. They've just been standing by and letting it happen. To take away that one particular and arguably truly salient ability of women is to essentially remove their uh, their utility. That's why fem the fe in the feminist camp, the Shumilith camp, the one that thinks that yeah, well, artificial technology is gonna, uh, artificial womb technology is going to get rid of the biological tyranny. Well, yeah, it could. But the fear, which, I mean, feminism has as its primary motive act of fear, since women are afraid of everything, uh, that's probably going to win out in the long run. Now, there's an entire, entirely uh, different element uh, to this discussion that involves, well, men, basically. This guy won't really want to focus on now. Um, so even though I do think the Dworkian school of thought, you know, the fearful, you know, we don't want the men, the men's to get control of reproductive technology, is ultimately probably going to win out. Uh, even if, even when, when artificial womb technology becomes reality, uh, I think the thought, the fear, as usual, is unfounded. And why? Well, <clears throat> look at men. You see... Men have no collective identity like women do, and I'm not suggesting we should, but everything that uh, f feminism is, as Barb Russell said many times, is perpetual advocacy machine, and uh, it represents all of womankind. Whether women, uh, whether women uh, consciously accede to that or not, it represents the interest of women um, above all else. And men have no such mechanism. So before moving on to the artificial womb and the possible consequences of that, I want to talk about, say, male birth control, that is, the male pill. Now, mind you, I've talked about this before, but there are really, um, the female 
reproductive physiology is, is several leagues more complex than, than the male. That is to say that the male pill could have been with us decades ago, prior even to the female pill. But we don't see it. As it stands now, as a male, you have a couple of options. Uh, you have condoms, vasectomy, which uh, is an invasive procedure, or the use of synthetic steroid compounds, which uh, the, the quantities of which you'd have to use to uh, render yourself temporarily infertile, make it impractical, and a lot of people don't like sticking needles in their quadriceps, glutes, or their uh, deltoids. So, you know, these are just not good options to have. The pill, I think, likely, unlikely, or likely will not become reality. Because men, men don't see themselves as a collective, and they don't represent their interests. Men throughout history have internalized their own disposability. I mean, remember the, what I said, that the guy from Aviapa said, I'm, I'm okay with being disposable as long as I get some goodies for it. Okay? So this is the inter internalization of, of disposability, of male disposability. The, the, the interest is not there in a male pill. I mean, I hate to sound the cynic and, and I hate to sound negative, but quite frankly, Quite frankly, uh, the uh, the interest is is not really there because if it were there, men would have pushed for it. And at the end of the day, money talks. I mean, if uh, men would pay for it and wanted it on mass, they would develop it. Even I believe, contrary to the wishes of feminists and women at large, if the money were there. And the money would be there if men had a pronounced interest in it, but they don't. You see, this is the problem. Men inter internalize their disposability. I, they don't really advocate for themselves on ev any, any plane of, uh, of existence. I mean, look at uh, that healthcare. They don't take care of themselves. They have no interest in uh, having extra research done for the sake of male-specific diseases or male primary diseases. Uh, prostate cancer, it's a very prominent example. Uh, men are more affected by coronary disease and yet 